I'll never forget the time my cat, Orangey, died and then came back to life. It started my junior year in college, late one night when I was home visiting my family for the weekend. I was sitting on the living room couch with my friend, Angela, trying to figure out how to score some wine coolers, when I glanced over at the footstool and noticed that Orangey was rolled over on his back with all four legs sticking straight up in the air, eyes rolled back in his head, stiff as a board. Angela, being a third year biology major, knew exactly what to do. She calmly kneeled down beside Orangey, checked his heartbeat, and listened to his breath. We both knew she was full of it. No response. Me, being the communication major, had a better idea. Oh, fuck, I said. We should really call someone. Though we didn't know how to conduct a medical examination on a cat, we were sure Orangey was dead. I was also sure this was my fault. Because when you're 18 years old and your mother constantly reminds you that your brain hasn't fully formed yet, you're bound to make lots of mistakes, like forgetting to clean the litter box or feed the cat or leave the toilet seat up so he could have water. <laughs> After wrapping Orangey in a fleece blanket, because dead things get cold, we jumped into the car with our lifeless kitty and sped away to the local animal ER. All I could think was, my mom is gonna be so mad at me. This was the first cat we'd had who enjoyed floating in the pool on a boogie board, who cuddled on purpose, and who'd hump blankets on the area rug during family movie nights. <laughs> my mom, being rather eccentric herself, adored Orangey for his quirks. It was 1997, before normal people had cell phones, so I couldn't call my mom to ask her what to do. But I did leave a note on the kitchen counter saying, the cat died, we're taking him to the vet for a checkup. <laughs> As I screeched into the animal ER parking lot, I expected trained medical personnel to run outside, rip Orangey from my arms, and calmly tell me everything was going to be okay because that's what George Clooney would do. <laughs> Instead, we ran inside to find a bored receptionist, glaring at us over her copy of Cosmo. What's your pet emergency? She asked sarcastically, looking at the undead kitty in my arms. You see, the second we walked through that door, Orangey rolled over in my arms, meowed, and started giving himself a facial with his little pink paw. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Angela and I looked at each other, stunned. The super busy receptionist didn't believe me when I told her Orangey was in fact dead, just now dead. When my mom and dad arrived at the vet and learned that Orangey had come back to life but was being examined just in case, my mom was outraged. Why are they examining him if he came back to life already? She inquired. <laughs> I don't know, mom. I was just trying to do the right thing. You know how much I love Orangey. I knew that line would get her. $500 later, we all returned home with a perfectly healthy kitty. We still don't know why he died that night, but that was just the, that was just the first round of Orangey's fake little feline death game. About a year prior, my older brother Ryan brought Orangey home for my mom, who had just been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. We were devastated and desperate for a distraction from the daily routine of chemotherapy, doctor's visits, and the heartache that comes from knowing you're about to lose your favorite person in the whole world. We knew that bringing my mom flowers or her favorite burrito from El Pollo Loco just wasn't going to cut it. We had to do something big, and in our grief-stricken hearts, a kitten was the answer. We knew that our mom loved cute, cuddly boy kitties. She thought girl cats were stuck-up bitches. <laughs> Though my dad detested cats, he let Orangey stay. He would have done anything to bring even a sliver of joy into my mom's life. Plus, my brother and I promised to take care of the cat full time. To prove it, Ryan and I took mom's new kitten to the vet for his shots. What's the cat's name? asked the receptionist. Oh, we're not naming him, I said. Well, your cat can't just not have a name. Obviously, I need to write something down in his chart. Fine, I said. Since he's orange, just write that. 
Truth is, we'd intentionally avoided naming the cat because our family's cats had a history of disappearing before six months. We figured if we named him, we'd get attached and we couldn't lose something else we loved. Every time we lost a cat, our mom sat us down and lovingly reminded us that boy cats need to sow their oats. The cat just moved up the street to be special friends with the neighbor's stuck-up bitch cat. <laughs> I'm sure he has a really great life there. This explanation worked until high school, when we finally noticed that canyon behind our house, the one filled with coyotes and mountain lions. The second time Orangey died was when Ryan ran him over with his Honda CRX. Ryan was coming home from community college one afternoon and failed to see Orangey sprawled out in the driveway, sunning himself. As Ryan drove his car up the driveway and into the garage, he heard an excruciating shriek and felt a thud under his tire. Ryan hopped out of the car to find Orangey lying in the driveway, lifeless. Mom, I just ran over Orangey. My mom and I ran outside panicked, expecting to find a bloody mess of cat. Instead, we found an intact orangey, slowly wagging his tail and stretching his arms and legs, just coming off of his afternoon nap. What the hell? Orangey stood up, looked at us condescendingly, and sauntered off into the backyard. Not a care in the world. For a few months, Orangey didn't die at all. We kept expecting something to happen to him, especially because he liked to tempt fate, staying outside all night, cavorting with the creatures of the canyon. Sure enough, we were woken up one night by the hideous screeching of a cat fight. My dad looked through his bedroom window into the backyard and saw declawed Orangey fighting a mountain lion. I still don't know if I believe my dad's description of the perpetrator, but Orangey definitely fought another creature, and it wasn't another domestic short hair. He was beat up and bloody, with tufts of fur missing from his little body, and he didn't give a shit. <laughs> he licked his wounds and walked it off. <laughs> Our amazing mom died in 1998. We all wished that she had nine lives, but she didn't. She made us kids promise to look after Orangey for the rest of his life, which she was sure would be short. <clears throat> Don't worry, Mom. We'll take good care of Orangey. He's going to live forever, I reassured her. Orangey bounced around from apartment to apartment as we settled into our adult lives until he finally moved to Seattle with my brother in 2007, where he fit right in with people who kind of always want to die. <laughs> In 2012, Orangey developed a series of illnesses which prompted the vet to tell my brother they just needed to, you know, keep him comfortable and love him as much as possible. He lost half his body weight, wouldn't eat, and wheezed constantly. When I went to visit my brother that year, I said goodbye to withering Orangey. He was so frail and so sick. There was no way he'd make it out of this one alive. My brother called me a couple months ago to tell me a really funny story. My five-year-old niece, Annabelle, had decided to play dress-up with Orangey the night before. Annabelle, not one to neglect accessories, gave Orangey a beautiful necklace to wear. When Annabelle ran up to my brother and tugged at his hand, saying in her sweet little Minnie Mouse voice, Daddy, Orangey's sleeping funny. Ryan scrambled upstairs. He found Orangey lying under Annabelle's bed, unresponsive, with a very tight rubber band. I mean, beautiful necklace wrapped around his neck. Ryan removed the rubber band, patted Orangey on the back, and wouldn't you know it, Orangey sauntered off into the living room, not a care in the world. <laughs>